What's up, everybody? Nate Bailey here, and I'm excited to have Thomas Keenan with Top Class Installations. And uh, I guess we've probably known each other a little bit through Facebook, right? That's kind of how the world works to, uh, nowadays. And actually, got to meet him in person just last week. If uh, you know, as we're recording this at Ryan Stuman's Million Dollar Mastermind event, which was amazing. Um, but we're not here to talk about that. But yeah, I got a chance to meet him and his wife, and, and uh, incredible uh couple and uh just thank you for being here hey nate thanks for inviting me sir i'm uh, i'm very grateful for the invitation and uh glad to be here you bet so yeah the first question i i usually like to start off with is the, the name of the podcast is called championship leadership and it was actually a friend of mine that that recommended that name and and at first i wasn't so sure um what i thought about it but uh so i'm always interested to hear like what's what's top of mind or what's present for you when you hear the term championship leadership? I feel like um, a leader just came into the room and knocked someone out. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's what the first thing comes to mind, you know, <laughs> the boss just walked in the room and just clocked someone. Boom. Yeah. Done. You know, whether it's competition, it's a problem, something like that. The boss just came in and took care of it. I love it, man. That's, uh, and I think you get the award for the best answer on that one so far. That, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So we'll talk to me like, who are some people in your life that you think are maybe one or two people that have really meet that championship leadership, uh, definition that you just said that have impacted, maybe impacted you from, from close, like personally, or maybe from afar, just, you know, leaders that you know of or that we know of. Sure. Uh, I have a, a, a bunch of those people in my life, luckily. Yeah. I'll give you my story real quick. So yeah, when I was four years old. My parents got divorced. All right. Um, my dad really wasn't there for me. He, my father was there for me growing up only for sports. If it wasn't sports related, he was nowhere to be found. Okay. Um, I'm not resentful, but it's just the way it was. Yep. So my mom basically had the burden of raising me on her own. So um, <clears throat> she was number one. You know, she did whatever she had to do in order to make sure that I was taken care of, literally. Um, so when I was six years old, my mom comes to me one day and, you know, not realizing what's going on in the background as a six-year-old, my mom's like, hey, um, I got a friend of mine and she's going to come live with us for a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. Whatever, mom. Cool. Right. You know, this friend comes over and I've known this woman now for a while since so it's a good friend of my mom's. And she was supposed to stay, I think, for like two weeks. And two weeks turned into, I don't even know how many years at this point. They, yeah. they now own a house together. Okay. They're like roommates. You know, my mom's divorced. She's got yeah. a friend. And um, her name is Donna Campanella. She's, uh, she's an aunt to me. She's, she's blood as far as I'm concerned, even though she technically isn't. Yeah, right. So, like, my mom is a very strong-willed person. So is Donna. Uh, Donna was a um, executive in advertising for some some big name companies: Sony, Lintas. Oh man, I'm I'm butchering this one big time right now. Anyway, a, a lot of big, you know, corporate America companies, and she was working with the top people. Uh, her last job was with Avon, and she was a global media director. Awesome. So being around her and my mom, strong-willed, you know, type A style personality females really kind of showed me um, and, 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 you know, I just absorbed that information growing up and being a kid, you know, and this, this is just the way you do things. You know, you don't, you don't take shit from anybody and you go out there and you get things done. So yeah. that's what I did. And their idea of doing it really didn't align with my idea of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so you know uh listen most most parents aunts uncles whatever they want you to you know go to college get a good job have that fancy 401k and you know yeah i have all the security and uh i realized very quickly that school was not for me so uh about the age of 15 or 16 um I was like, you know what, man, I'm getting into cars. I was always into motorcycles as a kid, you know, riding dirt bikes and stuff. But uh, as I got into, to, you know, a little bit older, getting close to getting a license, I was like, all right, you know, these, these cars are pretty cool. And I was like, oh, wow, all of a sudden, 
you can do all these fancy things to cars. And I was always working with my hands, always playing with things, building models as a kid. And um, my mom's like, you know, why don't you go work with your uncles? My mom had two brothers at the time. One of them passed away, unfortunately. And one of them uh, did auto body and the other one had an auto mechanic and detailing shop. So she would literally send me off with these guys uh, over the summer. And, you know, she didn't trust me here. I am 15, 16 years old. She's got to go out and, you know, make ends meet. She's right. a single mom. And she'd be like, get to your uncles and go to work. Like, All right. I actually wanted to. I was, I was eager to, to learn. And these two guys just, man, <laughs> it was out of love, but they abused the shit out of me. Yeah. You know, they, they made me work. There was no easy day working with those two guys. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know. I don't know how they just the worth ethic in them is instilled in me. And I love them for it to this day. You know, it's like yeah. <laughs> it was crazy at the time. You know, uh, one of one of my uncles basically said to me one day, he goes, if we go home today and your hands aren't bleeding, you didn't work hard enough. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, here I am, 16 years old. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. what do I have to do? And uh, sure as shit, you know, I, I went home that day and, and the hands had cuts, scrapes, bruises, and I had, I had attained that goal. So that kind of led into, you know, me wanting to work more with my hands and realizing that at the end of the day that I could actually have something that I could visualize. And it was, um, it was cool. So um, I was hanging out with a kid in school who was a little bit older than me. And he had, he had this like 87 Toyota Celica, Toyota Celica Corolla, whatever. And we're driving around town as kids do, you know, you're a young kid, you're not old enough to go to a bar or a club, but you know, you need to get out and you drive around aimlessly doing nothing. Yeah, you just drive around. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> driving around and he's got these two speakers in the back of this car that are enormously loud. Like, holy shit, I've never heard something like this before in my life. Um, so he drops me off that night and he opens up his trunk and he shows me this little amplifier in the side. Yeah. And, I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't realize you could do that to a car. Like, this is really cool. I was, I've always, uh, I've always been a music fanatic. I always loved music. So uh, he tells me, hey, I went on this, 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 um, it wasn't even a website. It was so long ago. He, uh, he hands me this, um, this magazine and it's a Crutchfield book. I, everyone I'm sure who's listening to this has seen a Crutchfield book at some point in time. It's just like a mail order catalog for audio gear. Yeah. Uh, car stereos, home, home audio. So I, I looked into it and I, I, I just completely fell in love with it and, and I dove in. It, it became my passion instantly. So uh, I'm all about this car audio thing and I'm trying to learn about it. And I realized that what I'm doing in, in the auto business with my uncles is cool, but I'm not really in love with it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go home dirty like a mechanic every day and I don't want to go and, and, and paint cars all day either. So I looked at this audio installation stuff and it was kind of the perfect mix because it, it mixed all of the trades into one. That's what really drew me into it. So there's, you know, there's woodworking involved, there's upholstery, there's welding, there is some auto body involved, believe it or not. Uh, and obviously the electrical end of it. So you kind of have to know all of these trades and put them into one in order to be a, a, a top audio installer. I'll even call yeah. it integrator at that point. So, um, I'm now in my senior year of high school and I get, I was an awful student. So <laughs> I, I had to go and take an elective in order to graduate high school. Yes. So I had to go in, so I go in, I see the shop teacher and it's, it's like technical drawing one-on-one. Like, oh. So I go in uh, and uh, I, I was there for like a week and uh, Mr. Gorgiulo was his name. He was, he was such, such a nice guy. So I said, Hey, Mr. G, this technical drawing thing isn't for me. I said, but I've been reading up on this thing here and I showed him this book. I said, uh, this is a MECP, Mobile Electronic Certified Professional. This is a study book. And it says here in the back of the book, if I can get uh, a librarian to proctor the test, I've become, I can become a certified installer. It's like, are you willing to help me out with this thing? And I didn't realize at the time, I was selling this guy. Yeah, uh, right. me, You know, and um, the guy took it. He said, all right. He goes, uh, let me, let me talk to the superiors, you know, my bosses and whatnot, the principal, whoever mm -hmm. and he came back a couple of days later. He's like, yeah, man, he goes, let's do this. He goes, I need the book. And he goes, what I'll do is I'll, I'll outline a course and, and make a couple of quizzes out of it. I'll give you chapters to read as your homework. And he goes, you know, you come back in, have a couple of quizzes. And then your final exam is going to be this test if you pass it or not. Like, all right, man. So I go into this thing. I study, study, study. Um, because I actually like it. 
I, I, my personality type is if I don't like something, good luck getting me to do it. Yeah, right. But yeah. if I want to do it, move out of the way and, and please do so quickly because I'm not going <laughs> to. <stop. laughs> so uh, I dive in, man. And, and in June of that year, I became a certified mobile electronics professional. Um, and the funny part is that I had never worked in an audio shop at this point in time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had tinkered with cars with my uncles, but I was not a true professional by no means. Right. You know, but I had the piece of paper that said I was. Yeah. So that's, uh, that was pretty much the beginning to, um, to getting kicked off. And yeah, I definitely had some fantastic mentors who, who did not hold me back and basically told me, you can do whatever you want to do. I'm very fortunate to have those people in my life. Yeah, that's great. You know, uh, I think before we started, you, you mentioned listening to my book and, and I talk a little bit about, um, it's great to have those people in your life, but most, you know, I think the majority of us, unfortunately, we have those that kind of try and protect us maybe that they might not really know what they're doing or, or, uh, but they're really just kind of robbing us of experiences and really going after our dreams. So it's incredible that you had that number one. And then number two, um, you know, just a championship leader really is someone that's going to take that road less traveled is going to, like you said, you, when you see something, when you, when you have something in mind, like there's, there's no stopping you, like get out of the way. Right. I think a championship level leader, I, I look to sports often um, in, in any of the great championship coaches, they're so willing to just do things that aren't, the ordinary that that um, that are ahead of the curve, ahead of everyone else, and also, um, you know, if if they they can see it right, that vision they're going to go after it and make it happen. That's it, man, it's all about the vision. Yeah, you know, um, I consider myself fortunate because uh, I'm a visionary. At least I think I am. Yeah, I have the the innate ability to look into the future and say. I can make that happen. If I can visualize it in my head, I can 100% do it. Yeah. You know, and it's, um, it's weird almost. Well, that's great. And then, you know, I mean, cause there's how many times do you hear someone talk about, you know, maybe seeing something in their head or having this great idea, but never going after it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's having that vision, but then also actually be like, all right, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to actually go do it. <laughs> right. Like talk about how you went from, from that, from the audio mm -hmm. installation uh, to to what you do now, top class installations, and maybe you know what is top class installations? Sure. When did that start, and how did that journey happen? Yeah, sure. So um, I kicked off my car audio career around 1999. Uh, seriously, I had actually uh, my mom and my aunt, who I just mentioned, um, came up with about 10 grand and sent me up to Boston to a trade school that no longer exists, unfortunately. And I went in there and worked with some of the best car audio guys on the planet at the time. I learned some cool stuff. Wow. And I spent like three months up there, which is really cool. So um, it was kind of like college for me. I, you know, I, I went yeah. away a little bit and I hung out and partied probably a little too much and yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> stuff you'd get arrested for today, probably. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I went up there, learned some cool things, came home and there was a local shop by me, uh, who was like the cream of the crop doing the nicest stuff in the Long Island area. And they were, they were doing work for a lot of the local rap stars and celebrities. I was like, that's the place I'm going. That's where I want to go. They got all the fancy cars out front. That's what yeah. I want to work on. So I went in there and, um, like pimp my ride type stuff or what? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah man. So uh, I walk in there, I meet the owner and, and uh, I tell him, you know, who I am, what I, I, here's this piece of paper. I just got some more schooling and uh, I'm your man. And he looked at me and he's like, you don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to tell you, he was so right. Yeah. He, I was, I was, you know, 19 years old thinking I knew everything and um, I didn't know shit. He was yes. so right. So I worked for that guy for about three years and uh, finally got to the point where I decided another genius uh, thought, but it actually worked out. I decided that I knew more than him. He didn't know <laughs> shit. And uh, I was going to start my own business. So I went and incorporated my first business when I was 21. Awesome. And it was, it was still car audio. I, I wanted to actually fabricate 
uh, more high, like a higher end fabrication than what this guy was allowing me to do. And I knew I could do it, but yeah. he wasn't selling it to the, to the customers and it wasn't giving me a chance to grow, enhance my, my installation skills. So I said, well, if you're going to hold me back, I'm going to go do it myself. Yeah. He didn't like that. And I didn't, I had the, you know, I don't give a shit attitude at that time in my life. And um, right. we kind of left on bad terms and we cleaned it up years later, but yeah. I went out, I had $300 cash in my pocket. And then that's how I started my first business, which looking back at it now, I was like, you know, what was that's I thinking? That's an awesome story, man. <laughs> yeah. So um, I kicked off that business. It lasted five years and I, I was able to do some really cool things. You know, I was able to uh, get myself involved in some, some like high level car shows and, and build some real serious competition level audio systems. Yeah. And, um, you know, basically whatever I wanted to do when I went into that shop that day, I just did it. And that became a problem. You know, um, like most entrepreneurs that start a business, I was a technician. Right. I only had the mindset of a technician. Yep. I didn't realize that when you first open your business, you now have to go and you have to t take out every hat. Like, here's my marketing hat. Here's my sales hat. Here's my HR hat. Yeah. Here's, here's all that, all the other hats that, that come along with it, including the toilet bowl scrubber, you know, and I, uh, I was renting this, uh, I was about a two or 3000 square foot facility. Okay. And, you know, the first time here I am, I have responsibilities. I got to pay, you know, he, you know, heat the place, heat, gas, phone, cable, uh, alarm system, central station, that kind of stuff, employees, sales tax. And it was like, holy shit. I didn't realize you had to pay all this stuff. Yeah. You know, and um, I didn't know anything about bookkeeping at the time. So, you know, here we are making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Look at all this money we're making. Meanwhile, if we were pulling in 250, we're spending 280. Yeah. yeah. You know, so <laughs> that top line doesn't always matter. Right. You know, so um, it wound up lasting five years and I eventually had to throw the towel in. Still to this day, the most difficult phone call that I had to make was to that landlord saying, hey, um, I know I signed a lease here for like eight years or whatever it was. Yeah. And I got to leave early. Yeah. And in, in our lease agreement, basically it stated that he could come back and charge me for all of the missed months that even though I wasn't there. Yeah. Right. And luckily he was a nice enough guy to realize that uh, a, I didn't have the money. Yeah. And B <laughs> he would actually absolutely bury me if, if, if he did that. So yeah. I was able to get away with that. And, um, I was, I was bitter for a while. You yeah. know, like my, my ego took a real big hit, you know, cause um, listen, man, you, you're a business owner. It's nice. It's nice to say when someone asks, Hey, what do you do? I said, I have my own business. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm just being, being real here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a nice thing to say. It's like it boosts your own confidence as those words come out of your mouth. So here I went around for, for five years saying, Oh, I'm on business. And then the next question I always got was how old are you? Like, oh, I'm 21, I'm 22. And you own your own business? Fuck yeah, I do. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was, that was cool. But it came to a point in time I, had to, I just had to cut the cord because I, I was bleeding bad. So I went to work for this guy um, about an hour away from where I was living at the time. It was an hour commute with no traffic each way. And uh, I was doing audio for him. He's a real sharp dude. He's still, he's still a close friend to this day. Um, just taught me a lot about being an adult and business. So I absorbed as much information as I could from him for those three years. I kind of worked through my bitterness. I, I wanted nothing to do with business when I first started working for him. Yeah, I was I mean, so done with right. dealing with customers and business. You know, a, a fire would pop up at the, at the store and I'd be like, hey, Jimmy, that's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I'd walk in the back and go work on a car. Yeah. You know, and, um, that's, that's one of the perks of being an employee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, what happened was a lot of my clientele from my, my shop followed me and they kept coming and saying, Hey, could you do some work for me? Do some work for me. And I kept a couple of customers going and I called it side work pretty much. You know, I yeah. come home from work and I say, Hey, you know, drop your car off at seven o'clock tonight and I'll put that remote start in for you, you know, or I'll, I'll, I'll have your windows tinted or whatever it was. So, a couple of years into that, uh, working for this guy, um, my now business partner calls me and it's funny, the guy that I met when I was 19 and started working for, who was doing the, the, the custom audio jobs to the rap stars. 
I met my business partner working there. And him and I stayed in contact the entire time, always helping each other out. Hey, I got a big side job. Can you come help me? And I would do the same thing to him, vice versa. Yeah. So he calls me up and he goes, hey, man, um, we got a customer that, that wants to spend some big money on an audio job. You, know, you, you want to get involved. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, <clears throat> I go over his house. We meet this guy and the guy's got a brand new Cadillac Escalade and he, he's willing to drop about $20,000 in cash Yeah. to have this, this gear put in. Yeah. All right, cool. My kind of job. Right. So we get involved with it and we're literally, he's, he's working a day job, you know, normal eight to five, whatever. I'm working in, in Riverhead, Long Island, which is an hour from where I'm living at the time. Yeah. So I'm working an eight hour shift plus a minimum two hour commute each way. Go home, take a nap, shower, eat dinner, and then go to my partner, my now partner's house and work on this guy's car for hours. We'd be yeah. done like three, four in the morning, go home, sleep an hour or two. And somehow, I don't even know how I made it back to work the next morning sometimes. Right. So you know, it was so unsafe looking back at it now. But you know what? That's that's what you do when you have the drive. You just you, it doesn't matter. You just get it done. So um, that lasted about a year. Those crazy hours, and finally, we're, we're we're coming down to the tail end of that project. And my my partner goes to me. He goes, "Hey, man." He goes, "This is crazy." He goes, "We have we we had cars lined up out front of his house. I'm sure his neighbors loved us." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had all this work he's like we have so much work he goes this what are we doing working for other people and him and i multiple times over the years had talked about partnering it was just never the right time you mm -hmm. know he was buying a house all right it's not a good time right now oh i'm having a kid all right it's not a good time right now and, yeah. and these these events just kept popping up in life and i've now side note here i've now learned this since i've i've, I've gotten married and bought houses and had kids there's never a right time never a good time right ever Ever. Yeah. So you, you can't let that hold you back. That's right. <clears throat> so um, we, uh, we finally committed in September of 2009 to incorporating top class installations. So what top class installation specializes is in is GPS tracking installations and dash camera installations in commercial fleet vehicles. And um, we started just me and him and we had two GPS accounts. And when I say GPS accounts, we actually are a third party subcontractor for the manufacturers and resellers of the tracking hardware and software solution. So um, we had two of those accounts and we were still doing a bunch of audio work and remote, remote starts. And we noticed that this GPS work just kept getting busier and busier and busier. And we're looking at the, the level of complexity, the time required to put a GPS in. And it's just ridiculously short it's yeah. almost comical compared to the work we were doing yeah right here I am, i'm working on a uh, let's say we do a remote start now this is a real simple very uh com comparison if i do a remote start in a vehicle on average i'm looking at a minimum of two hours of labor yeah the going rate to put a remote start in a car is about 250 to 300 dollars. yeah that includes the product that you're selling to the customer too really yeah so yes you know, how much money am I really making on this? Right. And now, you know, if something happens, the guy needs a part, it breaks down. I'm responsible. I'm going to get the tow truck or going to fix it. God forbid there's an issue. You know, luckily that doesn't happen very often, especially if you know what you're doing, but it does happen. Yeah. Um, so we start doing these GPS installations and it's literally a three wire connection to a vehicle <laughs> versus the remote start where you're connecting like 25 or 30 wires. Yeah. So your risk factor to damaging a vehicle is like way up here versus this basic GPS installation where there's only three wires. You call up, you say, Hey, is this thing working? Yeah, it's working. You write down some vehicle information, you submit an invoice and 30 days later you get paid. Awesome. So the work was simple. The pay was much greater than what we were making, you know, doing the audio and remote start work. And the volume was tenfold. Yeah. You know, so you get getting, let's, let's just throw a figure out there. Roughly we're getting $75 per GPS install. They take you about 20 to 35 minutes and they're sending you f uh, small fleets of 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 vehicles at a clip. Yeah. yeah. That money adds up real quick, especially when it's just two guys working in a business. Yeah. Right. And, um, 
that's how it started, you know, and we soon realized like, oh man, we can't handle all the work that's being sent to us. And then, then my eyes start opening to the possibilities of the industry. And I'm like, well, wait a second, we're only doing work for two companies. What if we start doing work for three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth companies. And we started doing that and it was like, just a bomb exploded. Like (laughs) there's so much work to do. There's not enough time in a day. And it was absolute mayhem. Yeah. So fast forward five years into the business, my wife's pregnant with our first kid. And like, I had this epiphany, like, you know, most people do when a major change happens in their life, like, holy shit, I'm literally, I'm on the road six days a week. Yeah. I'm driving anywhere from 30 to 50,000 miles a year on my vehicle. I'm literally driving more than I'm working. Yeah. Right. I, I don't want to raise a kid like this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm never going to be able to be home from, from my, my wife, my, 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 soon to come child. And I said, there's gotta be a better way. So here I go again, looking for something better. I I knew there was a better way to do business than what we currently were. Not that things were bad. We were just, we were just working like dogs. Yeah. We were, we were, yeah, we were the technicians in the business and being the technician within the business, you only work in the business. You don't work on the business. So, um, I started getting involved in, in, in reading a lot and I, I had this bug up my ass for a long time to work with a business coach. And, you know, when you first start looking into that stuff, you're like, Oh my God, that's that price tag is, whew, <laughs> man, I don't know if I can handle that. Yeah. You know, like, um, it's scary. You know, when, when you're first, when you're first out there shopping for that kind of, of help, you know, when you got people talking in your ear over here saying, Oh, it's a waste of money. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Right. Right. You know, well, just because you had a neg- negative experience doesn't mean that I'm going to have a negative experience. Yeah. Maybe you were too lazy and didn't do the work that the person told you to do. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, factors and variations there. So we hire a coach. We, we stick with the guy for like, I don't know, three, four months. And he was okay. I, I look at mentors and, and, and even the, the, you know, my mom and my aunt and my uncles. I look at people like that in life. And this isn't meant to be derogatory by no means. I look at them as stepping stones. You have to take value out of that person on a positive level. Okay. And what happens is you're going to grow as a person. When you grow, you're going to start pressing down this stone and you're going to have to eventually move off of it and put your weight someplace else. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for some magical reason, Every time that I'm about to make that step or I feel that that stone is sinking in my life, a new one pops up. Yeah. So we transitioned over to a new business coach who just had his shit together. And um, we started working with him. You know, he got us involved in, in, you know, heavily involved in systems and processes. Mm -hmm. It's all businesses, systems and processes. Right. You know, Um, we had a kick-ass website built. We started using, uh, you know, software to actually put things together. We started hiring people. We started developing hiring processes. And, and what we were doing was actually working on the business versus in the business. Now, through this whole time, this period, yeah, we were still working in the business because the machine still had to crank, still had to function. Um, but I learned so much and my eyes got open so wide to other possibilities that, uh, of things that were out there and available that, you know, I said, hey, my goal here now is to build this business and get it to a point where I no longer have to work in it. All I have to do is work on it. Yeah. And the beautiful part about when you actually get to that pinnacle point is when you work on the business only, you don't have to work on it that much. Right. Which is kind of weird. (laughs) Especially when, yeah, you're used to just working in it so much. And for so many hours, you almost probably feel a little guilty. (laughs) You totally, you totally feel guilty, Yeah. but I'll tell you what, what wound up happening to me. And I don't know if this is, you know, similar to you as I worked, you know, to get the business to that point and I'm working on the business, I realized, you know what, Hey, I don't necessarily have to work 85 hours this week to have the machine produce. Yeah. What do I do with the rest of that time? And, um, I had this. I call it a pipe dream at first, you know, when I first started going down this, this, this journey of, of learning, educating myself, I was in the car so much. The only way I could read, the only way I had time to read was audiobooks. So um, I'm 
crank it through this audiobook one day and it, I finish it as I'm pulling into my driveway at home. I'm backing up and I'm like, Hey man, wouldn't it be really cool one day to write a book? Okay. And then, you know, reality kicked in and I'm like, yeah, right. Good luck with that. <laughs> so, um, wind up doing it. And the reason that I wound up doing it was because of the people I surrounded myself with. Yeah. The people I surrounded myself with, you know, at this point in time, and um, I, you know, you're one of them is, um, you know, Oh, you need to write a book. That's ah, easy. This is how you do it. Yeah. Oh, that's all you got to do. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hours of work. Don't get me wrong. But when someone gives you the framework, the structure and says, all right, now just go execute. It's so much easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool shit. Yeah, no, that's awesome. You know, there's so much to unpack there, right? Um, and what you've said, number one, yeah, there's, there's never going to be the right time, right? So if, if you've got something in your life, really, that you want to do, you just go for it. There's no guarantees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it could all be over today on the way home or tomorrow or whatever. Like, there's literally no guarantees. And um, I just love how you're so willing to, along all of this journey, is to continue to listen, right, to what it is that you want, listen to yourself and and not necessarily to anyone else and just go after it and, and put the hours in, right? The price has to be paid. You've definitely paid the price along the way, mm -hmm. working at another place, working out of your buddy's home at night afterwards and, and, uh, and also just evolving, right? Championship leadership, just evolving along the way to, all right, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm working this many hours, driving this many miles. I got a kid on the way, I got a wife. Like this, this is not like something's going to have to give and, and I'm not willing to make that sacrifice, right? The family mm -hmm. the business and, and uh, so just figuring out ways to become a, a real actual business owner and then also to evolve along the way, invest in yourself and coaches. I love what you said. You know, you probably weren't ready for that second coach. Mm -hmm. Like there's just a general progression that we go. You had to go through the guy that was maybe just okay. And like you said, to get you to, the point where now you're ready for this guy that's got the systems and the processes to really get you where you're going. And yep. um, what's, what's the book? Tell me, tell us about the book. So the book is called unfuck your business. Um, basically how to get clear in your core values now. Uh, that's the title. So it's one thing that um, has, has really helped me focus and get aligned uh, over the past couple of years is core values. And I, I go into a bunch of stories within the book that, that talk about some of the hardships that we've faced as business owners. And one of the hardest things that we've done and still to this day it, it, challenge for us is hiring. Hiring is very difficult, especially when it comes to a skilled trade. So I'll, I'll give you a quick story here. Yeah. I'm working with this, this newer coach over here. He's 10, 15 minutes from my house. He's an awesome guy. He's just sharp as a tack. And I go in his office. So we met on Friday mornings at 10 a.m. from like 10 to 1 p.m. Every Friday, religiously. So I go in there and uh, he comes into the lobby. He goes, hey, man, you want to grab a cup of coffee? Yeah, man, let's go. So we go, in, we go into the uh, kitchen area, little coffee machine there, cranking this thing out. He looks at me and he's like, um, hey, man, you're right. I'm like, um, no, not really. He goes, you look really stressed. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we're still working heavily in the business and a little bit on the business. So he goes, you know, let's talk about it. So we grab a cup of coffee, go back to his office, sit down. I was like, his name's Dean. I'm like, Dean, we just had our third shitty hire in a row. And now the problem has gotten so bad that I was, I was relying on this, this last guy to come in, fill a role. And now we got rid of him because he wasn't a right fit for the team, which I didn't know at the time. Yeah. And since I now fired this guy, I let him go. I've got to go back into the business, into the field and do his work. And we actually had a, a really large project for the U S Navy. Um, we were going to a bunch of their bases up here in the Northeast and installing into government vehicles. Uh -huh. And it was like hundreds of vehicles over three or four different locations. It was yeah. like, it was months of work. Yeah. You know, so I literally had to step out of working on my business for, I think a three or three and a half month period, go do the work and then slowly build myself back into working on the business. So it was like, 
it's like, you know, we made 10 steps of progress and then made, I, I went back 30 steps and then had to <laughs> kind of go back right. up to where I was. It was, it was so frustrating, but you know what? You do what you have to do in order to make ends meet. You know, I knew if I didn't go and take care of that project, we would have a lost the GPS manufacturer partner as a customer, which I'm glad that I, I went there and I, I ate the bullet that day because right. a year yeah. later, that same company turned around and gave us a 6,000 unit project. Awesome. Yeah. So you do what you have to do. Yeah. Right. <sighs> cool stuff. So, yeah. So talk about building a team just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. How many employees do you have or installers? Are they, are they, are they salaried employees? Are they? Yeah, we have, uh, we have W2 employees. Uh, yeah. We're just about just under 20 at this point in time. Okay. And going back to my story there with the coach, because I, I love, I got sidetracked, unfortunately. Um, you know, basically, when I told him about these three shitty hires, he goes to me, he goes, hey, Tom, he goes, you know, uh, I mean, this core value things I've, I've been plugging in your ear now for about six months. He goes, um, you're ready to start listening to me and get clear on them and implement them into your business and your life. And I finally looked at him and I said, yeah, man. I said, Dean, you're right. Like you've been telling me for months now that I, I, I'm not clear on my core values and, and why we're in business. I have no idea. And um, we, we actually sat down that day and, and I spent like five hours in his office that day. And we just yes. went through things and went through things, did exercises. And I wasn't totally clear at that point, but I went home with enough of a, of a head start and a map to say, all right, this is what I have to do in my own time to get clear on this stuff. So I actually went and I got pretty darn clear on my core values. My partner went, he got somewhat clear on his. And then we went back into Dean's office over several weeks. It took about, about six months in total. Yeah. And we came up with, uh, with we're seven core values right now for our company. Okay. And we live and die by those core values. Yeah. So those core values basically tell us if we're going to get involved with someone business wise, if we're going to fire a client, we actually do that. People yeah. are like, holy shit, you fire clients? Yeah, right. Yeah, man. Yeah. Absolutely. It doesn't happen often, thank goodness. Yeah, but right. you know, if someone's not a right fit and they're causing more ruckus than anything, see you later. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's very important. And then what we wound up doing was um, we invested heavily and we went to a program called uh, Elite Entrepreneurs that is hosted by Infusionsoft. We use Infusionsoft as our CRM system. So yeah. we went to, I think it was a two or a three day in-person event at their headquarters in, uh, in Phoenix and literally got clear on our mission, our purpose, and, and, and left there with not only their playbook from their early years of business, but with written out statements and you know um, uh, meeting schedules, how often hold meetings, what these meetings are for, and we started to actually structure our small business like like a big corporation. And um, you know, it was again coaching is like you look at that price tag and you're like, oh, it scares you. But I can't tell you the ROI that we've gotten from spending that big money for for that two or three day event out there in uh, in Phoenix. You know, it's all at how you look at it, right? Uh, you know, you can look at it as an expense. You can look at it as an investment and. Like any, any good investment, if you're all in on it and you're willing to be open and to like implement, yeah, the return on investment should be much greater than that investment ever was. So sure. I think that's a big thing. You know, you talked earlier, yeah, obviously I'm a coach, that's why I deal with this all the time, but I think the biggest naysayers to like, oh, you're going to hire this guy, or are you going to pay that? How much? You know, the ones that they just can't see it, right? And they're probably not business owners. <laughs> Or they're business owners with this really, really uh, uh, narrow perspective on on, on growth and, and what it really takes, you know, mm -hmm. the power and really surrounding yourself with others that can help you to get to where you want to go. Um, what's, uh, you know, as we wrap this up here, what, what are one or two things that you could maybe really leave these listeners with? Again, championship leadership, business owners, uh, people just looking to you know, get a little further in life, right? You know, yeah. What are one or two things maybe you could you could leave them with? Sure, a couple couple things here. So, a work on yourself daily. 
I don't care how small it is or how, how insignificant you think it is. You have to prioritize yourself and work on you before anything else. And that's not just physical. It's physical. It's mental. Love you it. know, um, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta do something physical. Uh, you gotta, I'm a, a big fan of practicing gratitude every morning. I'm sure you're well aware of that. Yeah. Um, and you know, you gotta do something to, to work on your, on your mind. You gotta read something, listen to a podcast, make sure it's positive, turn the news off, you know, um, I guess it's been now over a year and a half. I just, I got to a point where I'm, I don't watch TV anymore. Yeah. You know, I don't say that to brag, but it's like, you know, yeah. there's nothing good on there. I it's used like, to watch a lot of TV too. Yeah, me board, too. Like back in the day. <laughs> yeah. It got to a point now where it's like, you know what, if I'm going to go watch something, I'll go inside with the wife and we'll go strategically pick out exactly what we're going to watch. And you yeah. know, maybe we'll watch a series on, on Netflix or something, you yeah. know, but that's it. I mean, the only other TV that I run across is maybe Pepper Pig. <laughs> oh, my kids are watching some, some yeah, of that stuff exactly. as I walk past the, uh, the TV. <laughs> right. You know, um, second thing here real big is uh, make sure you work on your leadership skills. They're yes. imperative, especially yeah. as, as you're a business owner, you have to be able to take care of people. Mm -hmm. Your people will either make or break you. You cannot do it all on your own. I tried for so many years to do everything myself and it just, it failed miserably and cost me a lot of money. When I closed my first business, I was over $80,000 in personal debt. And that doesn't yeah. include what the business owed. Right. You know? Um, and number three, I would say, if you're a business owner, um, think about your customer experience. Yeah. How, how would you like to be treated? What, what is the end result that you want if you were in your customer's shoes and then reverse engineer it, go backwards and, and plan out strategically plan out and map the steps that you would like to go through as a customer and then build that shit. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Great advice. And, um, let the listeners know as well, like how can they get a hold of your book? How can they find you if they want to follow you or get a hold of yep. you? Yeah. Yeah, so you can find me on uh, on Instagram or Facebook at Thomas Keenan, T-O-M-A-S. I don't have an H in my name. I know it's weird. Um, and you can go to thomaskeenan.com. There's links there to my book. Uh, there's links there to, I have an online training course coming out soon that teaches people how to become GPS tracking installers. Uh, it's an industry that is popping right now. And yeah. we're dying. We're literally dying for, for quality installation technicians. And uh -huh. if, you're, if you have an inkling and you want to start a business, there's definitely room for people who have the will uh, yeah. and some technical chops to, to get in there and make some really yeah. good money. Awesome, man. I appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day and your business to be here with us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Yeah. You too.